Hello, I'm Tony Perkins with Washington Watch. Each day, this program provides a biblical perspective on news, including insightful interviews with elected leaders, newsmakers, and cultural experts. I want to thank you for joining us today. We have a great program coming up, but first, here are some headlines from our friends with FISM News. For FISM News, I'm Samuel Case with your Washington Watch News Update. It's Wednesday, December 6th, and here are today's headlines. Well, the Senate confirmed 425 military nominees yesterday after Senator Tommy Tuberville lifted his blockade on most military promotions, a move that was celebrated by Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. Today, hundreds, hundreds of military families across the country can breathe a sigh of relief. The Senate has now unanimously confirmed hundreds of military nominations that were held up for 10 months by a single person, the senator from Alabama. Thank God these military officers will now get the promotions they so rightfully earned. Tuberville's been blocking mass promotions since February, forcing the Senate to vote on individual nominees in a rather time-consuming process. He's protesting the Pentagon's use of taxpayer money to fund abortion travel for service members, which he says is illegal, and that's a protest he's still applying to high-level nominees. I'm releasing everybody. I still got a hold on, I think, 11 four-star generals. Everybody else is completely released from me. Now, somebody else might, I think some, a few other people got holds on one or two or three people. But other than that, it's over. Tuberville says he's now considering bringing a lawsuit to end the Pentagon's abortion policy. And following his historic ouster a few months ago, former House Speaker Kevin McCarthy is now retiring from Congress, making that announcement earlier today. Today, I am driven by the same purpose that I felt when I arrived in Congress. But now it is time to pursue my passion in a new arena. While I'll be departing the House at the end of this year, I will never ever give up fighting for this country that I love so much. To all those who have supported me through the years, especially our constituents, thank you from the bottom of my heart. It brings to an end his 17-year congressional career, serving as whip, majority leader, and, of course, House Speaker. His departure further narrows Republicans' razor-thin majority in the House, especially after the chamber expelled Representative George Santos last week. Meanwhile, the FBI director issued a rather stark warning to Congress yesterday about the rising threat of terrorism. FISM's Ian Patrick has more on that. FBI Director Christopher Wray said yesterday before the Senate Judiciary Committee that the U.S. is facing the highest threat of terrorism that he has seen in his career. In response to a question from Senator Lindsey Graham on the issue, Wray said that he has, quote, never seen a time where so many threats are elevated at exactly the same time. Take a listen. How would you describe the threat matrix against America today from your point of view after having been at the FBI most of your adult life? So what I would say that is unique about the environment that we're in right now in my career is that while there may have been times over the years where individual threats could have been higher here or there than where they might be right now, I've never seen a time where all the threats or so many of the threats are all elevated all at exactly the same time. That's what makes this environment that we're in now so fraught. And finally, a legal battle over abortion is underway in the state of Texas. A woman is now suing the state to end her pregnancy, citing a fatal birth defect and also a history of health problems that put her at risk of complications. It's the first lawsuit of its kind following the overturning of Roe v. Wade and is the first since Texas passed its heartbeat law in 2022. That case is now being considered by the state Supreme Court. And with that, those are today's headlines from FISM News. Once again, I'm Samuel Case, and you can watch our full show tonight, 5 p.m. Eastern Time, on FISMnews.tv, and you can also find it on social media and by downloading the FISM app. Stay tuned for Washington Watch with Tony Perkins, and I'll see you again tomorrow with much more news coverage. We'll catch you then. See you next time.
From the heart of our nation's capital, here's Family Research Council President Tony Perkins. Welcome to this Wednesday edition of Washington Watch. Thanks for tuning in. We're broadcasting from our media center here in our Washington, D.C. headquarters before a live audience today. So... It may look and sound a little bit different. Wish you were here, but glad you've tuned in. Well, coming up, the Senate voted this afternoon not to advance President Biden's additional funding for Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan. Extreme Republicans are playing chicken with our national security. Republicans think they get everything they want without any bipartisan compromise. That's not the answer. That's not the answer. And now they're willing to literally kneecap Ukraine on the battlefield and damage our national security in the process. That was uh, President Biden earlier today. The vote, failure to uh, advance the bill, sets up a showdown now with the House, which has already approved funds for Israel, but has made clear funding for Ukraine will be considered by itself, but only if it includes fixing the U.S.'s open southern border. Oklahoma Senator James Langford, who has been leading the negotiations for Republicans in the Senate, will join us later here in studio. And speaking of the southern border, FBI Director Christopher Wray testifying before the Senate Judiciary Committee yesterday sounded the alarm over increased terrorist threats to the United States. I am concerned that we are in an elevated threat environment, a heightened threat environment from foreign terrorist organizations um, for a whole host of reasons. Um, and obviously their ability to exploit uh, any port of entry, including our southwest border, is a source of concern. The FBI director was using the elevated threat to seek reauthorization of secret surveillance tools the Bureau has abused. If the administration is so concerned about the threat, why did they not crack down on the illegal border crossings taking place? We're going to talk with former Secretary of Homeland Security Chad Wolf. In just a moment. And here's one that should enrage every parent in America. The parents of a Colorado girl are taking legal action after their daughter came here to Washington, D.C. with her elementary school this past June for a school trip. The girl was forced to share a bed with a biological boy who says he's a girl. The school's policies prevent parents from even knowing the gender of a student with whom their child is expected to share a bed on field trips. Meg Kilgannon joins me in studio for that one. On Monday, the Biden administration's Reproductive Rights Task Force, AAK, AKA their abortion task force, provided an update on the number of pro-life ag- advocates that they've arrested. Senior reporter and editor at the Washington Stand, Ben Johnson, will have the details for us later. Our word for today comes from John chapter 17. I have given them your word, And the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. John 17 is Jesus's final prayer before going to the cross. He prayed that the father would not take us out of the world, but would keep the world out of us. How can such a task be accomplished? the Word of God. The Word of God separates us. We must remain in this world because we have a mission to accomplish, to advance His kingdom. But to accomplish that mission, we must be in the Word, and the Word must be in us. To find out more about our journey through the Bible, go to frc.org slash Bible. Yeah, we're coming to the end of the year, and I want to invite you to join FRC in preparing for 2024 and the battles ahead by making a timely tax-deductible gift at the end of this year. With your help, we'll be ready to defend faith, family, and freedom. And we've got team, team members standing by to take your call today, 800-225-4008. That's 800-225-4008. Your, your tax-deductible gift uh, will be matched by a challenge match if received by December 31st. Give today by calling us at 800-225-4008. Zero eight. In testimony before the Senate Judiciary Committee this week, FBI Director Christopher Wray warned that the possibility of terrorist threats against the United States has reached its highest level in years. 
following the October 7th attack against Israel. This comes at a time as Republicans in both chambers of Congress are attempting to uh, resolve this issue by forcing the Biden administration to seal the southern border, at least change their policies. Joining me now to discuss this is Chad Wolf. He was the former acting secretary for the Department of Homeland Security and now chairman of the Center of Homeland Security and Immigration at the American First Policy Institute. Chad, welcome back to uh, the program. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you as well. So your reaction to the FBI director's testimony yesterday? Yeah, well, this is similar to testimony that Director Ray gave probably about two weeks ago, uh, also talking about the rise in the number of threats uh, that he sees across the board. And it's not just of what's going on in Israel and with Hamas, but obviously we got to look at what's going on in Afghanistan uh, and the consequences of that chaotic withdrawal two years ago. We got to look at what's going on on the southern border. And there's a, so there's a number in the CCP. And, and so there's a number of threats. And I think that for one manner or, uh, or another, they're all converging now. And I think the director's right where he's seen just a multitude, the highest number of threats that we've really seen since 9-11. And so I don't think it's a coincidence and it's not happenstance that this all occurs on, on President Biden's watch. The leadership or lack of leadership overseas is starting to reverberate now here at, in the homeland. So, Mr. Secretary, let me ask you this question. The one of the issues that the Republicans are saying we want in exchange for any additional funding to Ukraine is to secure the southern border. But we don't see any movement on behalf of the Biden administration to say, yeah, OK, I, I, I get it. We, we we've got the FBI director admitting that we have a problem there, that that's a part of the threat to America. But yet they're they're refusing to make any movements. It's really remarkable that they don't look at that southern border and see the images, right? We have 10,000 two days ago come across that border, 12,000 in the last 24 hours, that they don't look at that border and say it's an absolute disaster. We need to change course. And look, we're open to having changes and some fundamental differences in, uh, or changes to law so that we can manage this border better. They don't want to do any of it. Instead, they want Ukraine funding and some other funding, and they don't want to touch the border. They think what's occurring along the border is just fine. Uh, and it's just out of sync uh, uh, with most Americans, and it, it, it defies reality. Uh, Chad, the director of the FBI yesterday using his testimony to push for reauthorization of FISA, the surveillance tools under uh, Section 702, the, the ability for them to uh, continue to use these tools. Now, I've, I've had um, non-classified briefings on this, and I understand that they've been using this successfully, and there is a threat here. But there's also been a lot of misuse and abuse of their tools. And, and again, not willing to negotiate with Republicans and say, yes, we'll yeah. do this or we'll give up on this. They're just wanting it their way or it's the highway. Yeah, it seems to be a little bit of a pattern here. I think what the FBI director should be acknowledging that, yes, it, it has been abused for some time and we need to look at some reforms. And I think that's what you see from congressional Republicans. And there's been a number of uh, pieces of legislation introduced that says, look, this is a, a useful authority if used the right way, but we've seen it abused, so we need to reform it. Uh, but as you indicate, they don't seem to be engaged in that in that back and forth to say, yeah, look, we agree with you, let's, let's reform it so that we can keep it as a, uh, as a law enforcement and intelligence tool but use it the right way to protect Americans and not spy on them and do all these other things that they were doing. Uh, but it, again, it seems to be a pattern. Now, now, Chad, I know you've been in this business for a long time. You're currently, you're, you're not having access to, uh, to, to the current classified data, but based on trends, patterns that you see, uh, weaknesses under the current administration, uh, are you concerned that we might see something like what happened in Israel on October the 7th is some of these sleeper cells in here may be activated soon? Yeah, look, I think the, the risk is certainly high, uh, not only from the inspired threats that I think Director Ray talked about, but when you have 1.8 million gotaways that come across the southern border in the last almost three years, you don't know who they are. Um, and you see the number of CCP individuals coming over the border, 20,000 or more. You have to start asking yourself, what what are those hidden threats? And so I think that we are at a higher risk than we have ever been since 9-11. Uh, 
uh, because of the, some of the actions by this administration, the wide open southern border, the lack of leadership overseas. And you just see that with the amount of U.S. interest overseas being targeted and attacked almost on a daily basis. And so it, it's not a big leap to say some of that could start occurring here in the homeland. And look, we've got a robust law enforcement presence here. There's a lot of different ways that we're able to stop and disrupt. But that's not to say that we are able to catch everything. Do you think the department, the, the bureau has in the Department of Justice has been distracted by the focus that they've placed on their political agenda of going after pro-life individuals? I mean, we've seen an escalation of the use of the FACE Act. We're going to talk about that a little bit later in the program. But they've it, it's like they put a higher priority on going after their domestic political opponents than they have on protecting this country from real threats. Well, there's no doubt, right? So whether you're targeting the Catholic Church, you're targeting, uh, you know, the, the pro-life movement and supporters and pregnancy centers and, and all of that. And I think most Americans look at that, and I certainly look at that and say, aren't your resources better spent elsewhere actually tracking down perhaps terrorists and other individuals that want to do some really dire things here to Americans and to American communities? And then you look at the Department of Homeland Security, who to this very day will say the biggest threats to the homeland are climate change and white supremacists. And you just shake your head and say, is it divorced from reality? From everything that we're seeing in the news, that is not what most Americans are concerned about, and it's not what DHS law enforcement are concerned about. And so I think whether it's the Department of Justice, DHS, or elsewhere, I think a lot of them, unfortunately, are, are you know, putting in their political bias there. Uh, to further an agenda or not looking at the facts and, and the real threats. So, so, Chad Wolf, let me ask you this question, because you, you have, again, you have a long career in serving in this field. Um, how, how deep does that go? Is that just the political appointees and the political yeah. class? Once you get below that, you've got men and women who are committed and want to get the job done? Well, it's certainly the political leadership of those departments, without a doubt. Um, I saw it at, at DHS. There are some what we would what we call the administrative state, right? They also are referred to as the deep state. There are some there that are just not on board with certain agendas, and, and mainly from a Republican standpoint, right? And why is that? Because generally, Republicans are for smaller government and less power in the hands of the federal government. And if you're a career bureaucrat, that cuts at your center of power. You want more control, right? And so there's always going to be that healthy tension. And we certainly saw it, or I would say tension. I'm not sure it's healthy. There's certainly that tension. And we saw it in the Trump administration to levels that we've never seen it before. Democrats, for the most part, the Biden administration, for the most part, doesn't see that. Um, and they see individuals in career slots that, that are supportive of their agenda. And so... Um, you know, I think it does reverberate down into career individuals. I don't want to dismiss that the vast majority of, of career folks that work in these departments are patriotic Americans. They want to do the right thing. But like all, all individuals, they have bosses and supervisors, and they take their direction from, from you know, people running these departments right. and agencies. And so they have to do their job at the end of the day. Right. And this is uh, another example. Elections have consequences. Chad Wolf, thanks so much for joining us. Always great to see you. Merry Christmas. Thank you. All right, folks, uh, coming up, Meg Kilgannon joins me here on set as we talk about disturbing news out of education. That's next here on Washington Watch. Don't go away.
everything we do begins as an idea. Before there can be acts of courage, there must be the belief that some things are worth sacrificing for. Before there can be marriage, there is the idea that man should not be alone. Before there was freedom, there was the idea that individuals are created equal. It's true that all ideas have consequences, but we're less aware that all consequences are the fruit of ideas. Before there was murder, there was hate. Before there was a holocaust, there was the belief by some people that other people are undesirable. Our beliefs determine our behavior, and our beliefs about life's biggest questions determine our worldview. Where did I come from? Who decides what is right and wrong? What happens when I die? Our answers to these questions explain why people see the world so differently. Debates about abortion are really disagreements about where life gets its value. Debates over sexuality and gender and marriage are really disagreements about whether the rules are made by us or for us. What we think of as political debates are often much more than that. They're disagreements about the purpose of our lives and the source of truth. As Christians, our goal must be to think biblically about everything. Our goal is to help you see beyond red and blue, left and right, to see the battle of ideas at the root of it all. Our goal is to equip Christians with a biblical worldview and help them advance and defend the faith in their families, communities, and the public square. Cultural renewal doesn't begin with campaigns and elections. It begins with individuals turning from lies to truth. But that won't happen if people can't recognize a lie and don't believe truth exists. We want to help you see the spiritual war behind the political war, the truth claims behind the press release, and the forest from the trees. Christmas. Welcome back to Washington Watch. Good to have you with us as we are before a live audience here in the FRC Media Center at our headquarters in Washington, D.C. Right, the parents of a Colorado girl are taking action after their daughter came here to Washington, D.C. on one of those uh, elementary school field trips. It was this past June. Well, the girl was forced to share a bed with a biological boy who says he's a girl. Well, the school's policies prevent parents from knowing the gender of the student with whom their child is expected to share a bed with on a field trip. In fact, it hides it from their own parents. Joining me now to discuss this and more, Meg Kilgannon, Senior Fellow for Education Studies here at the Family Research Council. She served in the Department of Education during the Trump administration. Meg, welcome back to the program. Thanks for having me, Tony. All right, tell me this isn't true. I wish I could. I wish I could say we didn't predict this would be happening, but we certainly did predict it, and it is unfortunately true. And this is not isolated? No. This is, and this is coming out of the policies, started with the Obama administration, the Trump pushed the, uh, actually undid it, and then it came back with the Biden administration yes. in full force. With a vengeance, yes. So give us the details yes. of this case. So this case in Colorado, uh, this, this student, um, the, the boy who's identifying as a girl, um, I think that the, his, his status may have been unknown even to ch other children in the school. I'm not sure how long he'd, he had been at the school. But um, the parents, in, in addressing this need of their daughter to not share a bed with a biological boy, um, they had to, the school encouraged them to express a, a, something other than the real reason they wanted to change the room. Like you're, you're not, don't, don't say it's because you don't want your daughter to share a bed with a boy because that of course would be hateful because this boy is actually well, a girl. And according to the policies of the school, that would be, the, the problem is not with the fact that there is a boy sleeping in a girl's bed, it's that a girl didn't like the fact that, that a, a boy was sleeping in her bed. It's that a girl could not ignore the fact that a boy was sleeping in her bed. Right. She could not go along with the lie that this is actually a transgender girl. And so, so the parents, um, they were able to resolve the situation and, and she didn't, the, the student didn't have to share a bed with, this, with, this, uh, with the, the, the boy. Um, but that meant that some other girl on the trip did, right? right? right. <laughs> I mean, this has been ever, ever since these policies started, since, uh, you know, my, my sort of origin story back into politics is over this issue. And we said when our school board decided to go down this road, we said, what about the kids on trips? Yeah. What is my daughter on a trip going to be able to say, no, I don't want to share a bed with a 
I mean, and this is elementary school. Yes. Element. I mean, start. They're starting. I mean, I was early. thinking about band trips in high school, right? But this is these these kids are in fifth grade. Right. So the policy also states that, quote, under no circumstances should a transgender student be required to share a room with children whose gender identity conflicts with their own. <laughs> now, I know you've got to kind of draw a chart there to figure all that out. <laughs> but what about the normal children who don't want their privacy invaded? Where are their rights? They're not allowed to have an opinion. Right. They, their, their role is simply to make the existence of the transgender student acceptable to that student. And it is not, has nothing to do with the rights of the other children that are involved, which is the real shame of it. I mean, and, the, and the, this, this little boy who's identifying as a girl, he's not being well served by the adults in his life. No. <laughs> right. But this we're, is, we're failing that child, well, too. I, I've said this before, but this is, th there's this unholy trinity of the Biden administration and the left. It is abortion. Uh, we're going to talk more about that in a moment. Um, it is the LGBTQ agenda and it is climate. Those three. Yeah. In, in fact, I, I want to go to a clip that of John Kerry over at the COP28 conference in uh, the UAE in, in, in Dubai. Uh, I guess it was Monday or over the weekend he made these statements. Play that clip of uh, John Kerry, the, the uh, climate czar. If we can't hear Mother Nature and can't judge with our own eyes what the science is telling us, this is not about politics, there's no ideology, there's no pejorative against any one business or any approach. There is simply mathematics and physics and some chemistry and biology. That is what we are acting on. <laughs> I have a hard time believing that because my eyes tell me what a girl is and what a boy is. Biology tells me that and they're denying it. They are the deniers. Absolutely. I, I, that, that, is, that is the level of nonsense that you're confronting. I mean, this is when you follow the arguments of the left in their denial of God and their denial of the basic dignity of the human person, when you follow those things out to their logical conclusions, you end up with 10-year-old girls not being able to say, I don't want to sleep in a bed with, with a boy. But here's the good news, Meg Kilgannon. Parents are standing up. Yes. Just like these parents are. Yes. But now we've got to, just yesterday, uh, parents in Maryland and in Montgomery County were in court trying to make sure that the school allows them to opt their children out of this indoctrination. Right. And I, I think what is important for people to understand is the, the, the level of acceptance that is required of you as a person to to adopt what they think is right. They, you, you, they think that this material, this diversity, equity, and inclusion material is so basic to the instruction of your child that they couldn't possibly be opted out of it. It should be incorporated into every subject and every academic setting throughout the school day, which is absurd, right? But that's why it's so difficult for them to but, opt but your kid it, out. It goes because... back to the point that it is the unholy trinity. Yes. Yes. You, th this is a must. This is essential, and they will do whatever they have to do to get this into the minds of your children. Right. And that is why parents must stand up and say, enough is enough. And thank, thank God people are doing that. And we have some resources for them. Very quickly, where can they yes. find them? Yes. We want you to consider running for school boards. So you can push back on some of this nonsense. So we'd love it if you would go to www.frcaction.org slash schools. And there are lots of resources there for you to, to, to consider that call. All right, Meg Kilgannon, always great to see you. Thanks great so much for joining you. us. Thank you. Keep up the good work. All right, folks, and uh, we do have folks still standing by to take your call. If you would like to be a part of Standing with the Family Research Council, give us a call, 800-225-4008, and um, your gift will be doubled, all right, today, if you call right now, 800-225-4008. All right, coming up next, we're going to be talking about the U.S. Department of Justice boasting about using the Freedom of Access to Clinics Entrances Act to track down pro-lifers. That's right. Terrorists go free. Pro-lifers go to jail. That's next. Don't go away.
All of us are born with the desire to find truth and meaning. Where did I come from? What happens when I die? While our answers to these questions may divide us, we are united in our need for the freedom to answer life's biggest questions and make life's biggest decisions for ourselves. That's why religious freedom matters for everyone. Religious freedom matters because the powerful have long wanted to control those who are less powerful. Religious freedom matters because the freedom of those who are different is often threatened by those who believe different is dangerous. Leah Sherabu, a Christian teenager in Nigeria, remains a captive of Boko Haram for her refusal to renounce her Christian faith. Chinese pastor Wang Yi is serving a nine-year sentence for speaking publicly against the Chinese government. All of this because people in power decided different is dangerous. At the Center for Religious Liberty at Family Research Council, we promote religious freedom for everyone because the only alternative is religious freedom for no one. We encourage Americans and the American government to engage and advocate for the persecuted, and they do. We work every day to bring good news to the afflicted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners. We do it because that's what Jesus does. We work to give freedom to others because we ourselves have been set free. Washington Watch. We're broadcasting today from our media center and in our headquarters here in Washington, D.C. before a live audience. Supporters from across the country that are here joining us for a couple of days. So glad they are with us and glad you're with us as well. So this week, the U.S. Department of Justice boasted about using the Freedom of Access to Clinic Entrances Act or FACE Act, which was adopted back in the 90s when Bill Clinton was president. And it really is laid dormant for most of that time, but the Biden administration has used it unlike any other administration. Well, they were boasting on Monday about bringing 24 cases against 55 defendants, resulting in 23 convictions since January of 2021. That was among updates that came uh, during a briefing by Attorney General Merrick Garland uh, and the Reproductive Rights Task Force that the Justice Department created back in July of 2022. We established this task force as a whole of department effort to closely scrutinize these new complex and widespread threats to reproductive health for any infringements on federal protections. As the Attorney General has highlighted, we have not hesitated to act to vindicate those protections, be it through affirmative litigation, the department's ongoing FACE Act enforcement, and other work advising and defending the actions of federal agencies. That was the Associate Attorney General Vanita Gupta on Monday. Considering how pro-life women centers are 22 times more likely to be attacked than an abortion facility, the Department of Justice efforts only make it all the more clear that justice under this administration is not blind and the tools of justice are being weaponized. Join me now to talk about this, Ben Johnson, senior reporter and editor at The Washington Stand, who has written on this. Ben, thanks so much for uh, joining us today. Pleasure to be with you as always. 24 cases, that may not sound like much, but it's notable, right? It really is. This prosecution spree by the Biden administration is a massive uptick in the criminalization of the pro-life movement since Dobbs. Uh, Biden, as you mentioned, has prosecuted 24 cases, but that's in less than three years. To put that in perspective, in the 10 years before Biden took office, the Obama and Trump administrations combined only prosecuted 17 FACE Act cases. So this is a massive increase in just a very few years, uh, and it is no coincidence it's happened since Roe versus Wade was overturned. Now, Ben, in some of these cases, we've seen uh, aggressive, um, I would say overly aggressive enforcement and uh, overuse of force, have we not? Oh, certainly. In many of these cases, frankly, the, the uh, 
crime underlying the charges have been something akin to the 1960 sit-in movement or the civil rights movement. Uh, they would be virtually indistinguishable from that kind of peaceful pro-life activity, uh, both of them, of course, protesting laws that deny people's humanity. When you look at uh, the cases that they're bringing, these are pretty hardened criminals, as you can imagine. One of them is an 87-year-old concentration camp survivor who's facing a year in prison and a $10,000 fine. One of them was a Franciscan monk who was sentenced to six years, uh, six months, I should say, in a different kind of a cell. Uh, there are dozens of FACE Act prosecutions against standard people, people you would see in your churches on a Sunday morning. Uh, in uh, one case alone, there are 11 pro-life people, some of them in their uh, 60s and 70s, who are facing 11 years in prison and a $350,000 fine, again, for something that's akin to a civil rights sit-in. And not all of them, by the way, are churchgoers or Christians or religious at all. Uh, one of the uh, groups, there were nine members of a group called the Progressive Anti-Abortion Uprising. Uh, it's a secular group. They were protesting in front of a, an abortion facility in Washington, D.C. One man decided to cut a, a, a plea bargain with the prosecution, entered a guilty plea, and uh, his guilty plea ended up in a 10-year prison sentence. Of course, we know in uh, the case of, for example, a transgender activist who attacked a uh, pro-life uh, organization, he was acting out of his pro-abortion convictions, the Justice Department uh, decided to uh, recommend zero jail time for him. So this is not equal justice by any stretch of the imagination. So let's talk about that a little bit, because I, I noted in the intro that pro-life women's centers are 22 times more likely to be attacked than abortion facilities. What, what are we seeing on that front in terms of the DOJ pursuing those crimes? Well, that came up in a hearing with uh, Chip Roy, a, a confrontation that he had with Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights, Kristen Clark, in the DOJ. Uh, Clark mentioned many times that she's now reaching out to pro-life groups to try and increase the prosecution there. Uh, Chip Roy mentioned on the, on the floor that the most recent count under this administration, you have prosecutions overwhelmingly targeting pro-life people, uh, despite the fact that, as you mentioned, pro-life pro, um, organizations are much more likely, 22 times more likely to be targeted. The current rate, according to him, is about 35 to 1 under the Biden administration. So there's clearly a difference in enthusiasm for prosecuting pro-life sidewalk counselors. Uh, at that Monday meeting that I wrote about uh, for the Washington Stand, the Assistant Attorney General Vanita Gupta, who is a, a left-wing activist with a background in the Obama administration as well, has promised the DOJ is going to continue to prosecute pro-life advocates, and this is a quote, creatively and relentlessly. So we're going to see more of this uh, justice uh, being more of the Justice Department activity focused against pro-life activity. Uh, and that uh, that essentially is what we're going to see uh, as the thrust, despite the fact that there is this massive imbalance. They've made the imbalance even worse. Amazing. Uh, ben, thanks so much for uh, for joining us. And I encourage people to uh, to check out your article at The Washington Stand. Always great to see you. Likewise. Thank you so much. Folks, uh, it, the facts speak for themselves. There's not equal justice. This is why elections have consequence. I mean, why we have to vote, because elections have consequences. So I, I, again, I can encourage you, pray, vote, and stand. We've got to pray for this nation. We've got to pray for our leaders. We've got to vote for leaders who understand the truth and are willing to defend that truth. And then we've got to be willing to stand for it ourselves. All right, coming up after the break, Senator James Langford of Oklahoma joins me with the latest from Capitol Hill. That's next here on Washington Watch. Don't go away. The world is hurting. Streets are filled with crime. Families are broken. Sin is celebrated. And God is mocked. Everywhere we look, the wages of our sin are on full display. As Christians, we know that surrender to God's will is the solution to our biggest problems. But not everyone agrees. Even in church, we hear people say the most important thing is to be tolerant, that we shouldn't impose a morality on other people, and that loving our neighbor means celebrating what they do. But you can't do that. It's not that you don't love your neighbor, you do. But you care about God's opinion more than your neighbor's opinion, and this makes you different. In fact, sometimes it makes you feel alone, like you are the only one. But there is good news. You are not alone, not even close. Research has found that there are 59 million American adults who are a lot like you. 
There are millions of people around the country who are born again, deeply committed to practicing their faith, and believe the Bible is the reliable Word of God. But that's not all. They're also engaged in our government. They're voters. They're more likely to be involved in their community, and they're making a difference in elections. The problem is that a lot of them feel alone too. We want to change that. FRC wants to connect these 59 million Americans to speak the truth together, no matter the cost. If you want to learn more about this group and what it means to be a spiritually active, governance-engaged conservative, or if you want to find out if you are one of these sage cons yourself, go to frc.org slash sage con and take the quiz to find out. The world is hurting and we have the solution. We can't do it alone, but we can do it if we work together. That's what we're working toward every day. Join us. Go to frc.org slash S-A-G-E-C-O-N, SageCon, to learn more. That's S-A-G-E-C-O-N, SageCon, to learn more. I'm often asked by people, Tony, how do you stay encouraged? How do you deal with all of the stuff in Washington, D.C., the negative policies that are attacking our faith, our family, and our freedoms? Well, you want me to let you in on the secret? It's called the Word of God. And that is why the Family Research Council embarked on Stand on the Word, a two-year journey through the Bible. It's a chronological Bible reading plan with just 10 to 15 minutes a day. In two years, you will have covered the entire Bible. And to go along with this, Monday through Friday, I do a morning devotional that goes along with the reading of the day. It's all designed to encourage you on this journey because the Word of God, as the psalmist said, in my affliction, here's my comfort. Your word gives me life. That is our source of strength. To find out more, go to TonyPerkins.com or FRC.org slash Bible. And I invite you to join me every morning for our Stand on the Word Bible Devotion. It's beginning to look a lot like... I always like this like last segment because uh, Bing Crosby. I mean, how do, you, how do you beat that, you that know? sounds like Tony. I know. James Langford, my guest, who sounds like Moses or uh, <laughs> the voice of God coming into the room. All right. Uh, Senator James Langford of Oklahoma joins me. Just came off the, uh, the Senate floor and has got to actually go right back. Right back. Uh, the $110.5 billion supplemental that included funding for Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan did not advance because uh, Chuck Schumer, the scare leader in the Senate, refused to uh, yield to the concerns about the border. That's right. Yeah, there's border funding in it, but that funding was really going to be used to be able to faster facilitate people actually coming in so they get, don't get clogged up at the border. And we said absolutely not. I would tell you Republicans held together 100 percent. I was surprised. Blocked the movement of that bill in. That's called denying cloture. Wouldn't allow it to be even debated and said to Chuck Schumer, we will debate this once we actually have real border security. And he offered, well, how about we do an amendment? And we I, know I what that, that game is. That game is, okay, we'll give you an amendment. You'll get 50 second votes, 50 second votes. But it was oh. six. It was a 60-vote right. threshold. It's a 60-vote threshold. threshold. He'll say, well, you'll get 57 votes. Then, oh, sorry, you didn't get it. And then we're going to get what we want. We said, absolutely not. This is, this is an issue the American people, Republican, Democrat, Independent, care about. We have a border that's being overrun. Yesterday was the highest number ever in the history of the country. 12,080 people yesterday crossed our border. It was the highest September in the history of the country, highest October in the history of the country, highest wow. November in the history of the country, and yesterday was the highest single day in the history of the country. This is going exactly the wrong way, and everybody just says the answers are obvious. Let's do it. Now, you've been leading negotiations in the Senate over right. this bill, and of course, you've been at the border multiple times, so you know both issues quite well. Do we see the Democrats, the administration, yielding on this? On, on some, I would say. Uh, it, the, the challenge of it is the House has to get 218. You can do it purely partisan. So they passed a really good bill, which is H.R. 2, but with no Democrat support as well. And they said, okay, you guys go get 20 Democrats on your side. We couldn't get any on our side. It just, it's just not going to work that way. So I've got to work with a Democrat Senate and a Democrat White House to be able to negotiate a bill that can both pass our muster and a Republican House muster to be able to figure out how do we actually thread that needle. That means we're not going to get everything we want, but we've got to get the essential elements. So that what we are have those? What are those essential? What are those non-negotiables? Well, a, a couple non-negotiables. Let's take yesterday, twelve thousand and eighty people that actually came through. We had seven thousand of those were just released in the country, just released. 
because they had no room. We're at 400% capacity right now in those soft-sided facilities at the border. And so they're just processing people as fast as they can, checking them in, getting a fingerprint, giving them a piece of paper and saying, show up at a hearing four or five years from now and we'll screen you then. That can't happen. When you do that, that just tells the next person, flood the border right. again, and you'll get just released. It's like a blitz. Correct. The, these folks don't qualify for asylum. They're requesting asylum, but everyone knows they don't actually qualify for asylum. But, and they don't show up for their court hearing. Correct. They don't show up for the hearing. So the essential things is you've got to be able to screen for asylum at the border. You've right. got to be in detention, screen for asylum at the border, and you can't do mass releases in the country. It just incentivizes and, and more the, people and, to go. And the history is that we'll just kind of forget about it. And, right. and, and they're expecting at some point in time there'll be somebody who will just give them, uh, you know, just wipe the, cl- this, the slate clean and let them stay. Right. But we're not going to do that. I mean, that, the most basic thing. And then there's a group that's labeled by the administration. It's an older term on it called special interest aliens or special interest migrants. These are folks that come from known terrorism, right. known areas that we don't have criminal background information on. We don't know them, but we know the area of the world they're coming from is known to be terrorism. We have had a enormous rise in those of the tens of thousands that have come in just the last few months across our border. Chris Ray, who's the director of the FBI, just said yesterday, it's like warning lights are flashing on the dash every direction he's looking. And we're trying to be able to wake up the administration to say, you've always tried to pretend this is just a border issue. This is a national security issue we're dealing with. This is very different now. Yeah, we played a clip of uh, the director's testimony yesterday. So how can the, the administration defend not taking action at the border when their own FBI director is saying, I'm, I'm seeing the greatest threat level I've seen since 9-11? Right. Yeah, he's saying he's seen the greatest threat level he's seen in his career in the FBI is right now. We, we lose track of sometimes as Americans. It was people that were not legally present in the United States that carried out 9-11. Right. right. And I keep reminding everyone, we have an open border and every terrorist organization in the world knows it. It's not just those that are coming across and, you know, surrendering and then being released into the country. There are the, the, the known godaways, right. those who are evading contact with U.S. officials, which would tell me that since we're so liberal at the border by giving them, you know, a hotel room and letting them stay, I would turn myself in. They're uh, avoiding that. That tells me they have yeah. some ul- Motives. Sure. Yeah, the, the cartels will actually run 100, 150 people across the border at one spot. And just to tell you how, how organized this group of the cartels are, they'll pull people together, put 100 people across the border. When they do, then the Border Patrol come in to be able to manage the humanitarian reasons there. They'll actually put up a drone overhead to be able to watch what's happening. When they see the Border Patrol move in, then they'll have five guys in backpacks and camo three miles up river, and they will cross and go right into the country. And it happens every day. And so those individuals are probably paying a little bit higher price to Correct. get in because they're coming from probably a country of known terrorists and That's they right. have different motives. There are individuals that are paying the cartels thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 a person to be able to cross into the country. That's not coming in. That's not someone coming in who's a Sunday school teacher at home. Right. Nor looking for a minimum wage paying job. That's correct. That's correct. This is somebody who's being brought into the country. When you're paying $50,000 to be able to come into the country, you're being brought in for a reason, and it's not for good. And our intelligence would suggest that they're coming here for what? Well, they're coming in for every number of reasons. I would tell you in my state in Oklahoma, almost all the illegal marijuana operations that are happening are Chinese nationals that are actually partnering with Mexican cartels to be able to grow the marijuana, produce all the drugs, distribute fentanyl into the state and across the country. So there's a Chinese criminal organization and Mexican cartels partnering together to move people across the border to be able to do their operations here. That's happening in my state in Oklahoma, and you can multiply that around the country in human trafficking, prostitution, drug trafficking, these folks are not moving into the country for our benefit. I have a whole new meaning to fortune cookies, if that's what they're doing in Oklahoma. It is a whole different meaning, and I'd be glad to be able to give those back. All right. Uh, Senator Langford, I know you got to go. I want to thank you for stopping by and uh, appreciate your leadership on uh, Capitol Hill. Yeah, I'm glad to do appreciate your leadership here in the city as well. Thank right. you. James Langford from Oklahoma. Got to run back to uh, the Capitol, continue the negotiations. But uh, we're going to continue our conversation here. General Jerry Boykin joins me. Uh, Senate hearing today on uh, recruiting, military recruiting. General Jerry Boykin, Lieutenant General Jerry Boykin, 36 and a half years in the United States military, founding member of Delta Force. 
General, welcome back to the program. Thank you, Tony. Good to be with you. All right. Yesterday, uh, Senator Tommy Tuberville, we were with him last night, uh, withdrew his hold for uh, all officers under the four stars. And so he's allowing those promotions to go forward. That being over the issue of government funding, facilitating of travel for abortion. Um, your thoughts? Well, my thoughts are it's just what uh, the senator said last night. Uh, we're violating our own laws. Uh, the Hyde Amendment, I think, was very clear in terms of what uh, we're allowed to do with government funds regarding um, abortion, which was what it was all about. But uh, I got to tell you, Tony, I think that, uh, you know, he was down a little bit last night. Um, but I think he needs to stop and realize that he just set an example for all those people on the hill up there. He stood his ground. Ultimately, it didn't go his way, but he set an example for what every person on that hill ought to be. And they're not. Yeah. And and that was made clear last night, too. Well, the issue's not over. Uh, this funding, facilitating, taxpayer facilitation of abortion is not over because the National Defense Authorization Act uh, has an amendment that was in it. It, uh, I, it As I was coming into the studio, uh, the language has come back from the Senate with that language stripped out. Now... We've already spoken to members of the House, the Family Research Council Action. Our action arm has sent a letter to Capitol Hill that we will score that vote, meaning this is a vote that we will highlight. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a place we can't go because this sets precedent that we are okay with taxpayers being entangled in the facilitation of abortion. And, and you and I both, military veterans, believe in our military, want to see our military fully funded but we don't want to see them used as mules for the social agenda of the Biden administration. Yeah, that's right. And I think uh, one of the uh, uh, speakers there last night said that there's only been 12 times that this has been used. And it's such a big issue. But it, that's, that is because this whole issue of... Um, of abortion is kind of a one-trick pony for the whole Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. But again, it's precedent setting because you go all the way back to, to the Hyde's Helm Amendment. This is a separate statute that was adopted based upon those principles going all the way back you know, to, the, to the 1970s. And so that's been a bipartisan ground that we would not force taxpayers to fund something that they were uh, morally opposed to. Mm -hmm. And if, if Republicans say, well, it's just, you know, it's just 12 or it's, it's not that much money. It's, it is the principle. Sometimes That's you have right. to fight for That's principle. That's exactly what it is. It is all about the principle here. What, what's next? What's next? What, what law do we violate next uh, with no penalty? Right. We have to stand now. And that's what Tuberville was doing, was standing on something that he believed in. And if you if you, if you could have heard him last night, our audience did, but I thought he made a very clear case for why he did what he right. did. And I, I, I personally think he's a hero. Yeah, I commend uh, Senator Tuberville for his uh, 10, 11 months that he took this stand. And, but he saw that they were about to change the rules yep. and he used the football analogy on, on that. And, and I completely understand. But now, as I mentioned, this goes back to the National Defense Authorization Act. And, and folks, I'm going to give you a, a, a head start on this because the, uh, the language will probably be rolled out later tonight or tomorrow. It will be on the House floor. So I want to encourage you to contact your congressman and say, do not support the National Defense Authorization Act unless it keeps me as a taxpayer from having to facilitate abortions and take innocent life. Let them know that you're not going to be a part of that. You can uh, call the Capitol switchboard 202-224-3121. That's 202-224-3121. Call the Capitol switchboard and talk to your member of Congress. Talk to their staff. Say, well, I don't, I don't actually know who my congressman is. 
You need to, but all you have to do is call, give them your zip code, and they will connect you with the correct office. Or you can go to TonyPerkins.com. We've got resources there for you. Now, one of the points that um, the critics of Senator Tuberville was, uh, they were continually bringing up that he was hurting uh, recruitment uh, and those who are opposing the administration are hurting recruitment and retention in the military. Well, anybody that believes that, uh, I've got a bridge to sell you. <laughs> Out in California, as a matter of fact. <laughs> Listen, Tony, and you and I have talked about this repeatedly. If we had to go to war today, what they're saying is because of what Tuberville is doing, we're not ready. Our readiness is defunct. That's not the case because you don't have to wear four stars to command in a four-star organization, and right. it is done routinely. And I, for one, am one of those people that was in a three-star job before I had my third star. And I know if you look at it reasonably, you can't say we're hurting readiness when we put those people in those positions because they were the best ones for it. Now, what it is doing is it's disrupting their plans for the future, and that means they're, they're not going to be able to get out and get their, their board assignments, as uh, the guys were talking about last night. But these guys want to get out and go make some money and sit on these boards, and that's okay. That's a great, great thing to do after you finish. But to say that that is hurting readiness is just an outright lie or these people do not know what they're talking about. Well, I, I think the policies being pushed by this administration on our military are doing more damage to readiness. When they're more worried yeah. about the proficiency of their pronouns than how they shoot their weapons or execute their missions. Exactly, I, and, and I've talked about this before, Tony, and I know we're short on time, but if you go back to the uh, to the Vietnam War and you look at how those, those prisoners were treated and then how one of them stepped out and said, I don't know my country's policies anymore, but I support them. And he was beaten almost to death. And then you go back to 2016 when uh, two patrol boats were taken. And uh, the, the guy that was running that patrol boat, two of them, within an hour he was looking into the camera saying, this is all our fault, and we want to apologize to the Iranians. you got to say, what happened? What happened? Well, what happened was we, we downplayed the imperative for realistic, good training, and, and that has to be done. Right. But it's not being done in our military because we're wasting our time with DEI and all these nonsensical yet woke things. We've got to go back to the military's purpose, and right. that is to defend this country by fighting its wars, right. period. End of story. Right. General Jerry Boykin, thanks so much for thanks, stepping Tom. in today. Good to see you. And folks, I want to thank you for joining us as well. We've still got folks standing by to take your call. Give them a call, 800-225-4008. Until next time, I leave you once again with the encouraging words of the Apostle Paul found in Ephesians 6 where he says when you've done everything you can do, when you've prayed, when you've prepared, and when you have taken your stand, by all means, keep standing. Washington Watch with Tony Perkins is brought to you by Family Research Council and is entirely listener supported. Portions of the show discussing candidates are brought to you by Family Research Council Action. For more information on anything you've heard today or to find out how you can partner with us in our ongoing efforts to promote faith, family, and freedom, visit TonyPerkins.com. Also, to leave a comment about Washington Watch, call our watch line at 1-866-372-7234. That's 1-866-372-7234.